Well, hello. Today we are going to dive into the concept of subnetting. And with subnetting, one of the first basic rules that you need to know is how to deal with binary numbers and converting them to decimal and then back to uh, binary. So the very first thing we're going to do is do a little fundamental thinking. And so I'm going to write a number on the board. And I'm sure that everybody out there understands and realizes that this is 123. Now, you've been doing this since elementary school, and this is some very basic information, but maybe not broken down into the way that we're going to look at it here for a moment as we lay the foundation for binary. Now, this is 123. And we know this because we've dealt with these numbers for years. But here in the US and abroad, uh, we deal with a base 10 number system. We call it base 10 because every position can be anything from zero all the way down to nine, which gives us 10 different combinations or 10 possibilities for each of these characters. So that being said, let me erase that. And this is, like I said, a base 10. And so above, I'm going to put here a 10 and a power of 0. The very first character all the way to the right is always to the power of 0. And again, this is base 10, therefore we have 10 to the 0 power. The next digit over, one digit over, therefore it is the power of 10 to the first. The next digit, 10 to the second. And if we kept going, we'd have 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth, and so on and so forth. Now, the next thing we need to think about is what is the value of each of these characters. Well, any number to the zero power is always, no matter what the base is, to the zero power is always worth one. Anything to the first power is worth whatever the base is. If it's a base eight, it would be worth eight. If it was a base 16, it'd be worth 16. Since this is a base 10, it is worth 10. And then, of course, when we go over to 10 to the second, that means we take the base and we multiply it by itself, or 10 times 10. 10 times 10, of course, equals 100. Now we know what each value is worth. Now all we have to determine is how many of them is there and what is the total when we add it up so we're going to start all the way to the right and i'm going to say okay this value each one is worth one how many of them do i have i have three so over here i'm going to do three ones next to that is the value that's worth 10 how many of them do we have? We have two of them. So again, down here, I'm going to put my two tens. We're going to move to the third value, which is worth 100. How many do we have? We have one. We put that down here. Now all we have to do is add them up. Three two, and one. So we know that it's 123. Now this is a simple explanation. You do this in your head many times dealing with numbers in your day-to-day -day routine. But now we're going to apply the same thing to a binary number. Now most binary numbers we're going to deal with will be in groups of eight. So I'm going to put up eight different characters. And since this is binary, bi meaning two, 
there are two possibilities of numbers for each character. That is either a zero or a one. So let's try, let me spread it out a little bit. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters. All right. So just like before, we're going to look at the powers. Now, I already said that this was binary, which meant two. It's either a one or a zero. So this is going to be a base two number system. We're going to start all the way at the right again. Anything in that first character is always going to be to the zero power. So two to the zero. Next comes two to the first, two to the second, two to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. Again, remember groups of eight, even though we're only going up to the power of seventh, our first digit was a zero. So that really counts as our first of the eight digits. So again, we need to know what each value or each place is worth. And so we're going to put up that value. I said earlier that anything to the zero power is always worth one. So that first character is worth one. The next character, two to the first, just as I said before, anything to the first power is always worth the base. In this case, it's a two. Anything to the second power is the base times itself. In this case, two times two is four. The next place, two to the third, that means two times two times two, or eight. And the nice thing, since this happens to be a base two number systems, if you notice, the one, when we doubled it, it became two. When two was doubled, it became four. Four was doubled, it became eight. We can continue across without all the multiplication. So two eights or double, 16. Double 16, 32. Double 34, or 32 is 64. And double 64, 128. So now we have everything in place to calculate what this binary number is worth in decimal. We're going to do just like we did before. We're going to start all the way to the right. We are going to add up all of the ones where we actually have something, not the zeros, but the ones, and see what this number is worth. So again, we're going to start over here in the first position, or the ones. How many do we have? We don't have any, so we don't have to write anything down. We move to the next position. It's worth two. Do we have any? We sure do. We have one of them. So we're going to put a two here. We get to the next position. It's worth four. Do we have any? We sure do, so we're going to put a four over here. We get to the next position. It's worth eight, but unfortunately we don't have any, so we can keep going. We move to the next position. The 16s, we don't have any, so we keep going. We get up to the 32s. Do we have one? We sure do, so we're going to add 32 to our numbers. We move next to the 64s. Do we have one? We sure do, so we add 64. And then we move to the 128. Do we have any? No, it's a zero, so we can stop right there. All we have to do now, add up our numbers. Two and four make six. 10, 12, carry the one. Six and three is nine, plus one is 10. This binary number is the equivalent in decimal of 102. Let's do another example while we're here. We're going to leave all of our powers up. 
because the only thing that's going to change is our binary number. So let's do one zero zero one zero zero one one. How about that? We're going to do all the same steps starting all the way to the right. Do we have any ones? We sure do, so we're going to add a one. Do we have any twos? Yes, so we're going to add a two. Any fours? Nope. Any eights? No way. Sixteen? Yep, there's a sixteen. Let's add him in there. Thirty twos? Nope. Sixty four? Nope. Last one, 128. Yes, we do. Let's put him down. All we have to do is add them up now. So 1 and 2 make 3, plus 6 is 9, plus 8 is 17. So we're going to carry the 1, 2, 3, 4, bring down the 1. 147 is the equivalent of this binary number, 1001001. Remember, most everything we do in computers is always going to be eight characters uh, for binary numbers. So let's pause here for a moment. In your packet are nine little problems where you have binary numbers that you are going to convert in the decimal. And that is on page one. And we'll be back in just a moment to go the opposite direction and take a decimal number and turn it in to a binary. All righty, welcome back. Hopefully you've done those problems and didn't have any issues. Now we're going to look at, let's take a decimal number and convert it into a binary number. So I'm going to start off with a number, let's say, how about the number 63? That's a good number. We are going to go the opposite direction. So we're going to do two things different or opposite that we did before. When we convert it to decimal, we started at the right. We're actually going to start at the left this time. The other thing that we did when we convert it from binary to decimal, we added numbers together. This time, we're going to subtract. So remember, opposite direction, opposite activity. So this is going to be maybe even simpler. We'll see what you think. But what we're going to do is look at the number we're trying to convert. We're going to start all the way to the left. And my question is, can I subtract 128 from 63? And your answer should be no, because it's much larger than 63. If the answer is no, we're going to put a zero. We're not going to do anything to it. We're going to move to the next digit. It's worth 64. Can we subtract 64 from 63? Again, the answer is no, it's bigger. So we're going to put another zero there. We're going to get to the 32s. Can I subtract 32 from 63? Why, yes, I can. So I'm going to put a 1 there, and I'm actually going to subtract 32. What am I left with? 31. Again, I'm going to move to the next position. It's worth 16. Can I subtract that from 31? I sure can. So I put me a 1. And I subtract 16. What does that leave me with? 15. Can I subtract 8 from that? Yep. So I'll put me a 1. Minus 8. Leaves me with 7. Can I subtract 4? Yes, I can. Leaves me with 3. I get down to the 2. Can I subtract 2 from 3? Yes. So I put another 1 there. I subtract 2 here. Leaves me with 1. Can I subtract 1 from 1? I sure can. There's my 1. 
and I'm down to zero, which is where I need to be. So 63 in binary is zero, zero, one, 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 one. Again, always have all eight characters. So let's do another one. How about something a little larger this time? How about, well, let's go real big. How about 200? 200. So working the same direction and the same method, I'm going to say, can I subtract 128 from 200? And the answer should be yes. So I put a 1 there, and I subtract 128. And if I put this in my calculator, just so I don't make any mistakes, leaves me with 72. Can I subtract 72 from 64? Yes, I can. Minus 64 leaves me with... Eight. Can I subtract 32 from 8? No. So it gets a 0. Can I subtract 16? No. Can I subtract 8 from 8? Yes, I can. So I'll put a 1, subtract 8, and I'm down to 0. So I'm done, right? No. If I don't put something in these three positions, Somebody's going to assume this is the one, this is the two, four, and so forth. So I have to have something in those three positions. Can I subtract four from zero? No. Can I subtract two from zero? No. Can I subtract one from zero? No. So we still have all eight characters, and 200 in decimal converts into 1100. Zero, zero. 1000 zero, zero, zero in binary. At the bottom of page one are eight problems converting from a decimal number into a binary. So I'm going to pause here for a moment and have you finish up page one. All righty, welcome back. Hopefully, you converted decimal numbers into binary without any issues. Uh, this next section, we are looking at IPv4 address numbers. And in IPv4, we have classifications of addresses. And as you can see on the right-hand side, we have class A all the way through class E. Now, in your work, you will probably only ever see class A, B, or C. Those are the three main ones. D and E are for experimentation and for some lab uh, work in companies that are developing uh, computer equipment. But you still need to at least be aware of the five classifications. In the next section, the top of page two, you have about seven or eight IP addresses, and you're asked just a simple task of what class is this address. Is it an A, a B, a C, a D, or an E? Now, if you look to the right, beside of each classification, you're going to see that there are a set of two numbers. These numbers all represent the very first number in an IPv4 address. IPv4 addresses are always four numbers separate it by three dots. And so in this particular activity, the only thing we're going to look at, the only thing we care about, is what is the very first number and where does it correspond within these ranges. So we're going to look at the very first example. It begins with 106. All we have to determine is where does 106 fall within these ranges? And I think everybody can say, oh, 106, that's going to be between 1 and 127. So that happens to be 
a class A. So the little line beside or the little answer blank, all we're going to do is put the letter A. We're going to move to the second problem, and it begins with 199. Where does 199 end up over here? Well, that happens to be between 192 and 223, so it's a class C. So again, all we have to do is put the letter of the class. Next is 125. Where does 125 fall? Between 1 and 127. So we have another class A. Next is 155. Where does 155 fall in place? What happens to be between 128 and 191? So it's a class B. 86. 86 is going to be another class A. And last but not least, 192. When we look over here, 192 is a class C. And so now what I'm going to do is pause and give you a moment to do the top half of page number two. And all you have to do is look at that first digit and determine what class is this address. All right, welcome back. Uh, we just finished looking at IP addresses and what classifications they are. And now we're going to take it a little bit further. We're going to say, all right, we can see these IP addresses. We know they're a class A, B, C, or what have you. What portion is the network numbers and what portion is the host? Every IP address is broken into two pieces. One is the network, the other is the host. Now, you might think about this very similar to sending a letter to Grandma. With Grandma, you're going to put what city she lives in, but you also need to put what her specific address is in that city. And so the network is kind of like the city. It gets us to the right network, and then the host is like the specific address, it gets us to the right machine in that network. So we're going to use the same classifications that we looked at earlier on the right, but we're also going to look at a little information down below called the subnet mask. Every time your machine requests information on the internet or you send an email to grandma, both the classification and a subnet is used to determine what network do we send it to and what specific computer in that network. So in our first three examples, we want to know of these four numbers, because it's not the same all the way across, and we'll see why here in a moment, which portions are the network. Now the network is determined mostly by the subnet mask. And so you'll see we have class A, class A, class B, class B, class C, class C. This particular example and the problems you're going to have in the book will not have a D or an E, only the first three. Now, down here in the subnet mask, this 255 is important, but so are the zeros. The 255 tells us that that number or that place in the four numbers is the network piece. Any zeros are referred to as the host portions. And so when we go from a class A to a class B, you can see now we need two numbers to make up a network and two numbers to make up a host. And likewise, when we move to a class C, we have three numbers that get us to the right network, and only one itty bitty number gets us to the right machine. So now we're going to apply this information and circle the numbers 
that are either the network portion up here or the host portion down here. So we're going to start here with the network. We're going to look at that very first number as we've always done in the past. It happens to be 99. My question is, what class is that? Well, 99 falls between 1 and 127, which means it's a class A. If I go down here and look at a class A subnet mask, it tells me only the first number is the network portion. The other three are hosts. What do I care about for this first part? The network. So I'm only going to circle the very first number. So over here, I'm going to circle the 99. That's the network. Problem number two, 213. Where does that fall? Well, that happens to fall between 192 and 223. So this is a class C. If I go down here to the subnet mask with class C, my network is three numbers. So I'm going to circle the first three numbers in that IP address. Last but not least in the network part, I'm going to do what address is this? It's 157. I have to find it here in my list. It happens to be a class B. Class B has two 255s or two network numbers. So I'm going to circle only the two numbers. The last three examples are doing the same thing, except we don't care about the network portion. We care about the host portion. The hosts are the zeros. But we're going to do exactly the same thing. The first step, what class is it? 199 falls into a class C. A class C has how many hosts? Just has that last one because the other three are networked. So we're only going to circle, in this case, the 10. Our next number, 192, I'm sorry, 191. Where does it fall? It's a class B. We look at the class B subnet mask. We care about the host. So how many zeros? The last two are zeros. So we are going to circle the 16.3. Last but not least, we start with 92. 92 happens to be a class A. We come down to a class A subnet mask. Which ones are hosts? And it's the last three. So I am going to circle the 37.14.201. At this point, I'm going to pause. There are two sets or two rows of numbers at the bottom of page two. The left-hand side, it says circle the network portion, like we did here. The second set or the second column says circle the host portion, which is what we did here. So I'm going to pause. Please finish page two. Okay, we are back, and we are looking at the default subnet mask. And so this is kind of a half step where we just came from. We're not going to circle what parts the network or the host, but what we do want to do is much like one of those first activities where we just listed whether it was class A, B, C, D, or E. This time we're going to put down what is the actual subnet mask for each of these IP addresses. So just like before, we're going to look at the very first number only. This happens to be 140. Where does 140 fall within my list? It happens to be a class B. What is the class B subnet mask? 255, 255, zero, zero. That is my answer. So underneath here, I'm going to put 255, 255, 0, dot 0.0. And you're going to have this same thing with page number 3. Problem number 2, 219. Where does 219 fall? That happens to be a class C. 
What is the class C subnet mask? Triple 255.0. So again, I'm going to do 255, 255, 255, 0. Problem 3 begins with 10. Where is 10 at? That's a class A. Class A is a single 255 and three zeros. So 255, 0, 0, 0. And last but not least, 140. It happens to be a class B. Again, we find the class B subnet mask, double 255, double zero. So our answer, 255.255.0. So at this point, we're going to pause. Please complete chapter, I'm sorry, page number three. There are about 14 problems where all you have to do is figure out what class it is and write down what the corresponding default subnet mask is. Okay, welcome back. And we are at the final piece of this first packet. We are actually going to do what's known as a custom subnet. That means we're going to look at a class A, B, or C address and change the subnet mask to modify it to meet the best needs of our network, whether it's a very small network, a medium network, or a larger network. So here we have an address that we were given, maybe from our ISP, and we are going to subnet that to match these two pieces of criteria. And that is we want to divide this single network into at least 14 subnets or smaller networks. And inside of each one of these networks, we need to have at least 14 hosts or numbers to apply to computers, printers, servers, and so forth. Now, one of the reasons we subnet is security. Uh, another one is to decrease some of the amount of network traffic so that we don't have problems with collisions and that kind of thing within the network. So we're just looking at a simple 192.10.10.0 network and making sure we can get 14 little networks out of it with at least 14 numbers in each network. So here's the process. The very first thing we're going to do is answer a couple of these questions here on the right-hand side. The very first one at the very top says address class. So we have to look at this first number, 192, and determine is this an A, B, or a C. If you use that chart from the inside cover of your packet, you will see that 192 is a class C. The next thing that it asks you for is the default subnet mask. Well, that's the same thing we just did in the last section. Since this is a class C, we know that this is a triple 255.0. So I'm going to put this in here. The very last thing we're going to do is the custom subnet mask. And right now, we're not going to answer any of these until we have divided this network up. And then we'll come back and fill in those answers. So the very first thing that I like to do is say, if this is a class C, which of these numbers is host portion? Because when we subnet, we can't change the already set network. We can only change our piece of the puzzle which are the host numbers. We have but one bit that's a zero. So that's the very last number. This is the numbers that we can play with. We can't change the 192. We can't change the 10. We can't change this 10 because they're already predetermined by the 255s. What I like to do is take and draw my address down here. 
And the very first three numbers I'll make small because I already know I can't touch those. But we're going to go back to something we did in the very first section of our packet. And that is take a decimal number and convert it into binary. Now this is simple because we're talking about the number zero. In binary, keeping all eight characters, we're going to have eight zeros. Still the exact same number. What we're going to play with, though, is the binary portions of this last number. So the very first step after we lay this out is determine what each character is worth. Now, we're not talking about binary this time. What we're talking about is what is each worth as far as subnetting. Now, my very first question, and we're going to start from the right-hand side, and this is going to be host portions. My question is, this first character, how many different characters can it have? You're correct. It's either a one or a zero, which means it has two possibilities. If I move to the second character, which includes the first, how many combinations do I have? Well, I could have zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one for a total of four possibilities. I'm going to move on to position three. How many possibilities do I have in binary? Well, we could do the laying it out here, or what was two doubled? It was four. What's four doubled? Eight. What's eight doubled? Sixteen. Thirty-two. Sixty-four. One twenty-eight. Two. Fifty-six. We're going to do something similar going the opposite direction for subnets. Again, the very first character has how many possibilities? It's either a zero or a one, so two. We go to the second position, just like from the right, four because we double it. Doubling four makes eight, 16. 32, it's the same numbers, just going in the opposite direction. All right, so we're almost ready to actually do some subnetting. So the very first question you will have, or I have, is what are we looking for? Well, in this particular case, I have given you both how many subnets we need and how many usable hosts. That being said, there are two ways to solve this problem, and that is looking at it from the subnet side or looking at it from the host side. It just so happens it doesn't matter which one we go, it's going to be the exact same answer at the end. So I'm going to go with the number of subnets. That being said, my question is how many do I need? 14. If I look at the subnet numbers, can I get 14? Out of two? No. Can I get 14 out of four? No. Can I get 14 out of eight? Absolutely not. Can I get 14 out of 16? Yes, I can. I want to draw a line after the 16. Remember, I'm going in this direction. So after 16 puts my line right there. Now I know where we are subdividing. We are going to take these four characters, and four of them are going to be added to the network side to make subnets. The last four are going to be used for hosts in each of the subnets. So here's how we're going to do this. We're going to start answering a couple of these questions. The very first one is the total number of subnets, because you remember that is what we started as far as our problem, what we wanted to solve. 
So what I'm looking for is from the subnet side, because we're asked for subnets, what is the number before the line? Well, it happens to be 16. So over here on the right, total number of subnets, we have 16 of them. We need 14. That means we're going to have two, not necessarily wasted, but maybe for further growth later on. So we have the total number of subnets being 16. The next question is the total number of host addresses. Well, here's the host. This time we're going the opposite direction. What's the number before the line? Happens to be 16. Therefore, my answer is 16. Now I'm going to pause here for just a moment and say we have 16. Can we get 14 out of that? I believe we can. Which brings us to our next question. Down here it says number of usable addresses, not total, usable. What in the world do they mean by usable? Well, it's pretty simple. In any set of network addresses, there are two numbers you can never, ever, 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 ever use. And that is the very first number because that very first number is the network number. The very last number you also cannot use, it is known as the broadcast number. So the first one is the network to make sure that I get to the right network. The last one is the broadcast for when I need to send the message to every computer within that network. So those two addresses, the very first and the very last, can never be assigned to any particular device. That means I can use all the ones in the middle. So if I take two away from my total of 16 hosts, what does that leave me with usables? 14. What did I need? 14. So I am in really good shape. We have but two answers yet to find. Number of bits borrowed. Basically what that's saying is before we subnet it, these first three numbers were the network portion, which means my line was here at that point. When I subnet it, it moved to here. So how many bits are there between the first original network and now my new custom subnet. One, two, three, four. So we have borrowed four bits. One last thing to do with this problem, and that is to determine what the custom subnet mask is. It's not the triple 255 anymore because we borrowed some of these zeros and turned them in to ones. So we have to configure and figure out what this custom subnet mask is. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is the original three 255s, remember I said we couldn't change these numbers? They have to stay 255s. So I'm going to put that much up here. What we got to figure out is what does this zero now become? Well, that zero was eight zeros, but once we borrowed those bits, these now become ones. Now we have to convert this binary number into decimal. That is what goes in that last place. So if we do that, you might remember from that first section. This was worth 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. We're just going to add them up. So we have a 16, a 32, a 64, and a 128. We add those up. 
8 and 4 is 12, and 2 make 14, and 6 make 20. 2 and 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, carry the 1, 240. So that 0 now, 240. So our custom subnet mask is 255, 255, 255, 240. That tells any computer, any router, anything on the network that we have divided our original network into 16 pieces. And so there are 16 network numbers, there are 16 broadcast numbers, a set for each of our subnetted networks. Computer does this in seconds, looking at the IP address that it's supposed to send something to and the custom subnet mask that is also accompanying it. Give me a moment to pause here, and I'm going to do one more problem before I let you loose. So hang tight for just a sec, and the magic of computers. All right, one more example before we move on. So we have a new network address. I've already laid that out with, again, the host values and the subnet values. The only thing I need to do is come up with either number of subnets needed or number of usable hosts. Now, I'm going to use number of usable hosts this time, and I'm not going to think about the networks at all at this point. Maybe the boss came to you and said, hey, we need to subdivide, but we need to have at least X number of computers in each network. And so that's what I'm going to come up with uh, for you today. And I'm going to say we need 24 usable hosts in each of our subnets. And then we're going to see where that leaves us. So just like before, the very first step I'm going to ask is what is the classification? So our very first number or the very first octet is 200. 200 happens to be a class, that's right, a class C. So we're going to put that up there for us. Our default subnet mask is going to be, you guessed it, triple 255. Dot zero. Custom, we're going to come back, subnets and all that once we figure out where our line has moved to. Remember that here's our original line right now before we subnet. So we need to get hosts. We need to have at least 24 of them. So looking at the host numbers, my question to you is, can we get 24 out of 2? No. Out of 4? No. Out of 8? No. Out of 16? No. Out of 32? Absolutely we can. So where do we draw the line? Well, this time we're counting hosts, so we're counting from the right. Again, it's always after the number we want, so it's going to be after 32. That being said, now we have to look at some of these questions that we can answer at this point. The very first one is, what is the total number of subnets we now have? Well, if we look at subnets and the number before the line is 8. So we have eight subnets in this particular setup. The next question is, what is the total number of host addresses? Again, starting on the host side, the number before the line is 32. So we have 32 possible host addresses. The next thing we're asked is, what is the number of usables? Remember, you cannot use the first number. You cannot use the last number. So if we subtract 2 from 32, that leaves us with 30. We have 30 numbers. How many numbers do we need? 24. So we're in great shape. We're going to have 6 left over for growth if we ever need it. But it matches our criteria. The next question is how many bits did we borrow? 
Well, how many zeros are there between the original line and the new line? One, two, three of them. So we have borrowed three bits. Last question, custom subnet mask. Remember the 255s I can't touch. So I'm gonna go ahead and put them up here. All we have to do is figure out what that zero becomes. The bits that we borrow, remember become ones. Everything on the host side remains zeros. And we have to calculate what it's worth. So remember, when we talk about binary values, we start with 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So again, starting at the right, we have a 32, we have a 64, and we have a 128. We have to add those numbers together. 8 and 4 make 12, and 2 make a 4, carry a 1. 6 and 2 make 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, carry a 1. 1 and 1 make 2. So our last digit is 224. So our custom subnet mask is 255, 255.224. On pages nine to the end, you have five little problems, just like this to do. They are all class C. Yes, you can subnet class A and B. It's a little bit more involved, a lot larger numbers. Because we're just introducing you to this, we're not gonna ask you to do an A or a B at this point in this class. But please do those five problems. You're going to answer all these questions just as we did here in these two problems. And thank you for attending the first of two videos on subnetting.